We had four Pizza Huts and over 10 KFCs. Um, and uh, you don't see that parallel in the middle class environment of local food. So the interesting thing for us in fast food, uh, sort of this American imported fast food is, um, it's actually associated as a middle class luxury. So it's 20% more expensive than what you would pay for the same exact thing in the US because of all the shipping charges. Nothing is actually being brought in. Uh, everything is being brought in and very little is actually being um, uh, sourced locally. Um, this is actually a, a, fi a figure that came from the African Development Bank. So currently, we're somewhere around 35 billion US dollars of importation of food for the continent. And by 2025, it's going to be up to $110 billion. So it's not a question of money. It's a question of how you invest that money. Because if that, all that money is going to be spent, what does it look like if we actually use it for more sustainable means of uh, consuming? And um, I think in order for the food waste to survive, we need to pass them down. We need to have recipes. We need to keep them exciting and new and fresh. And there is a way forward. I've kind of distilled it down into three components for myself. The first is actually doing documentation and research to understand what the traditions were, what the ingredients were, what their value was or is, and what the agricultural practices are. With that, using some innovation, sharing that with populations so that they feel in control to be able to use that information um, to change the way they consume. And then lastly, being able to share that with the rest of the world. I think that's important because the lessons need to be learned by others. Um, I think a lot of what I'm saying is not new to any culture, but it's happening in real time now in the African continent. And the sooner that we can actually start to understand these lessons, we can share them widely, um, but also to create economies that brings uh, money back to smallhold farmers and to um, these populations where this information is coming from. The good news is that we're doing this work and it is actually getting noticed. The work is not yet completed. There's a lot more to do. But I think for me, what success looks like, success looks like um, traditional methods of malnutrition being used to support uh, what we're doing. Right now, in cases of malnutrition, we're importing something called plumpy nut uh, from France, which is actually made from peanut butter, which probably comes from the continent, which has been fortified rather than actually finding ways of doing a lot of this ourselves. Success also looks like understanding the medicinal properties of some of these ingredients and making sure we put them in the, in the, on the plates so that there's actually less need for other supplementation further down the line. Success looks like being able to have a good understanding of culinary heritage throughout. Um, so these are all elements that I, I want us to take forward. And so, um, there are about five or six lessons that I think that I can distill from my experience, and many of them are relevant today, and I think we can share them um, amongst ourselves. The first one, of course, is plant forward. So the African continent is currently the um, most plant forward continent uh, in the world. Um, a lot of our nuts, and, uh, nuts and, and seeds are being used as the base of soups and stews supplemented with beans and um, lentils, as well as greens. In terms of no low waste cooking, we very much adhere to that. Uh, in this picture, what you'll see on the upper corner is something, um, in Ghana we call it wele, in Nigeria they call it pomo. And what it is, it's the skin of a cow. And it's actually a delicacy, and um, it's, uh, there's a whole thing around how to cook it exactly right. Uh, my favorite sort of co-product story is in Nigeria, there was a shoe company that was like 170 million people, a great chance to make a lot of money. So they built this factory, but when they opened, they started looking for the leather. And when they went looking for it, they realized they couldn't find it because there was a full economy of people that were buying it for consumption. So they actually eventually had to close the factory down. So um, it's not just for um, how we use animals, but it's also vegetables, um, so it's sort of that whole root to stem. When you look at something as simple as a sweet potato, I'm always surprised when I talk to my American friends and they don't realize that sweet potato leaves are actually edible. They're really delicious, <laughs> actually. Um, there will be a session, a uh, couple sessions, actually. The, there's one session, the Zero 
um, Zero Waste Kitchen, which is the Innovation Challenge 3 that will be looking at the Zero Waste Kitchen. So that's where it's going to be reverberated later on in the coming days. Next, we have bold flavor over fat. So when you look at classic French cuisine, there's a lot of cream and butters that are used to build flavor. And in a lot of the African cuisine, we use our preservation elements that come in. So if you're making a bean stew, you're going to add maybe a little piece of smoked fish to that. And that piece of smoked fish adds a lot of flavor, and you don't need much, and that actually carries through. We use a lot of spices as well to build flavor. So there are three sessions. I think uh, there's a challenge, innovation challenge one, looking at um, culture as strategy. There's another one looking at coasting flavor out of vegetables. And another one um, looking at, um, I believe, uh, um, building flavor for craveability. That will all be looking at how to build flavor with your vegetables. Um, wild and forage is always something that I'm really excited about. This is um, a goma leaf. That's what we call it in Ghana. The leaf is actually from um, a nightshade family that's similar to eggplants. And um, these leaves um, grow in the wild. We never really plant them. They just happen to be there and we happen to eat them. And um, it kind of works really well in a lot of the tropics. This is um, a green that is, is very widely used. And I think it increases uh, biodiversity and there's a lot of other wild foods that we need to engage with. And we're going to be looking at biodiversity in Spotlight um, 4 during the next couple of days. And uh, communal dining is something that I think is really quite special. Um, the name of my company is Midunu, which is short for Va Midunu, which is in uh, Eve and it means come, let's eat. One of my favorite things about the African continent is no matter where you go, no matter how much someone has, if they're eating and you kind of happen to be around, they will always invite you. Um, when I was in Senegal, my first invitation, I went, and there's this uh, dish called chabuchen. It's a big plate, rice, fish, um, vegetables, and a sauce. And when I got there, as I'm struggling through my high school French um, and eating, it's a communal plate, I just realized that after about 10 minutes, I'm really full, but there's still a lot of food in front of my plate. And it's because everyone has actually given me the best parts of their dish. So there's a tradition that when you have a visitor, in addition to the fish, they add shrimp or other shellfish that they have available. And in addition to that, while you're sitting there, everyone gives you what they think is their favorite part so that you will have that. So that part of the dish was actually growing because as I'm having this conversation, everyone's giving me their favorite parts of the dish. Um, so this is actually injera, which uh, for those of you who've had Ethiopian food, you know it. And it's the base of the, the dishes and then the food goes on top of it where it absorbs all this amazing flavor. It's made out of teff, which is another one of my favorite subjects, ancient grains. And um, teff, fonio, sorghum, millet, are some of these ancient grains that I really love talking about. I think they're fantastic because they're gluten-free, and they also are climate smart and do really well in poor, um, poor quality soil. So they do really well everywhere. Um, and I think it's a great way for us to integrate them into what we're doing. We'll be talking in the Innovation Challenge 2 about African and Eastern Mediterranean grains and legumes. Uh, I wanted to sort of finish by saying those are some of the, the lessons that I think that I want to share with you. There are a lot more, um, but I think it's important for us for, to learn them, share them, and protect them. This uh, is actually uh, an image of a symbol in uh, the Ashanti uh, Kingdom in Ghana. There was a, there is something called Adinkra symbols. These symbols represent important concepts in society. This particular one is called Sankofa. And um, what it is, is it's a, it's a chicken or some kind of poultry that's facing forward. Feet, body are facing forward, but the neck is going back. It's going back to pick a golden egg to bring forward. It translates directly to um, go back and get it. So it's about taking what's, what's from the past and what's important to help us navigate into the future. And I think this is something that we're all kind of looking at in the next couple of days. Um, so I just wanted to leave that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lassie. Um, 
I think shifting our conception of what's healthy from the Western conception is, is really key to making drastic changes to the way that we're eating. And uh, Greg talked about the Torre Barra Mediterranean Center. Um, when I'm wor not working on CIA conferences, I'm actually in Barcelona working on that project now. And one of the things that's fascinating is how much the Californian way of eating, of healthy modern eating, is really dominating there. Where I can have an avocado toast or a poke bowl or a grain bowl much more easily closer to my apartment than I can um, tapas or croquettes or things like that or traditional foods. Um, of course, I live in the center. There are a lot of yoga studios, so all of that is very related. But it's this food that is so American and so Californian in a way that has really permeated, permeated what we think of as a healthy healthy food discourse, um, and that is planned forward um, and good-ish, um, but at a time when it's important, for example, to talk more about why the Mediterranean diet should be what people are, are using, uh, it, it's very, um, uh, it's an interesting contrast to have to deal with. So um, we are now going to shift to the first of our spotlights. We thought that it was um, essential while food and deliciousness are driving the conversation at this conference to also give you scientific information. Um, you will get a lot more of that when you join us in June at Menus of Change, but they are really important elements that make the scientific case for why we should switch to more plant-forward diets. Um, and we've asked Alison Reiter to do this um, for us. She has been a lecturing instructor at, in the School of Culinary Science and Nutrition at the CIA in Hyde Park since 2005, she, 15. She also works a lot with us here at the Strategic Initiatives Group to co coordinate the International Teaching Kitchen Collaborative and to bridge the CIA's health and sustainability industry leadership work with our educational, with educational curriculum for future chefs. Um, Allison is, uh, has an MS in public health from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of public health. She was also a um, program officer for the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, where she provided scientific information for the uh, National Nas um, Meatless Monday campaign. So she's been doing this um, for a while, and uh, she will be taking us through a, three, a series of four different scientific spotlights throughout the conference, and she will also be giving an in-depth um, uh, talk on Friday on protein as well during one of the breakout. So without further ado, Alison Reiter. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I'm happy to give you just short little spotlights of information and in short sessions over the next couple days, um, really to, to highlight some of the evidence base behind um, why we're all here and to really feature some of our internal um, resources and um, you know, information that's available to you as well. So I'm going to highlight this protein flip. This is available on our menusofchange.org website. And there's a lot here just around protein. So I'm going to start with protein because that's really uh, what it all boils down to right now. We're in the midst of a, a, a cultural obsession with protein. And it really makes people wonder, like, am I not getting enough protein? Am I protein deficient? Short answer is no. You're likely not protein deficient if you live in this country. And it, looking at the statistics here, on average, Americans are consuming somewhere around 100 grams per day, give or take. And that is well over what the recommended dietary allowance is, about 0.8 grams per kilogram. And so we know protein plays a really important role. Most Americans are consuming too much. But if we really dig down into the food sources, we see that um, as much as 85% of the protein that we're consuming in this country is coming from meat and animal sources. And um, it's about half red meat, specifically, and about a quarter um, processed meat. And if we look at just meat consumption globally, Americans are among the top meat consuming countries in the world. Um, we consume about three times as much meat as the global average. That is 10 billion burgers. <laughs> um, and if we look at a global map here, you will see just what the spread looks like internationally. So there is a lot of disparity between um, high meat consuming developed countries and more on the, on the lower end side too of developing nations that are still very low. 
Um, but we're seeing the numbers increase as, as countries are becoming more developed, the, the meat and animal products um, are increasing as, as well. This is another way to look at it, another interesting um, chart by Christopher Gardner uh, and his team at Stanford that looks at um, protein consumption by country. So you're looking at the population uh, kind of proportionally uh, across the bottom and then meat consumption along the y-axis. And we're seeing that most, most countries are over-consuming meat and the majority is coming from animal sources. Um, and the U.S., Canada, um, parts of South America, Australia, those tend to be the some smaller uh, populations, but highest um, meat-consuming countries in the world. So why does this matter? I think we're all here because we believe this matters, and we realize this is going to be a really uh, big challenge going into the future. As population continues to rise, we're seeing all sorts of environmental issues related to the way that we produce meat industrially, and we see it on the health side too. So really the messages around health and environmental sustainability are converging when it comes to our protein choices on the plate. Um, this is another resource we have through Menus of Change that's uh, called Protein Plays, and there's a lot of really great information on this as well. There's a whole FAQ section um, that really digs down into a lot of the protein myths. And one of the protein myths that I want to cover today, and I'll be going into a lot more detail if you are in the um, breakout session with me on Friday, but this idea that um, this, this concept of complete versus incomplete proteins. And if you only have plant proteins and you're not going to get the amino acids your body needs, therefore you're going to be protein deficient. And that's just not the case. So these are what I would consider to be myths. That, um, that yes, animal sources of protein are higher quality in the sense that they have a good array of those essential amino acids, but that's not to say that plant proteins are devoid of those amino acids. And this is a um, very bu busy graph to, to show you. Um, Christopher Gardner, again, and his team really broke this down, and they showed um, by different protein food sources what the amino acid breakdown is. And so, yeah, there's going to be um, certain foods like beans and grains are going to be proportionately low in some of the amino acids, but if you're um, consuming a wide variety of, of plant protein foods, there's no need to really play, pay close attention to combining certain proteins at one given time. Um, or you know, if you're just consuming a little bit of the animal protein, that's going to cover all your amino acid bases. So the facts here is that nearly all plant foods really do contain those amino acids. It's not that they are missing or completely devoid of those amino acids, and that our protein needs can easily be met through uh, just a diverse array of food choices, even if it's vegetarian and vegan. So vegetarian and vegans are not necessarily you know, at higher risk of protein deficiency. Um, so it's, it's not necessary to pay close attention to those complementary proteins at the same time. Um, so that is the you know, myth one that I will throw out for you today and hopefully dispel for you. And tomorrow morning and into tomorrow, I'll be covering a little bit more of um, diet quality and how we need to think about plant forward as, the, as a shorthand for really um, high quality plant forward diet. So thank you for your time today and I'll, you'll see more of me in the next couple of days. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, I want to mention, uh, Selassie talked about food waste, and uh, that's obviously something that we're paying very close attention to uh, during the conference. It's not just like, oh, if you're doing plan forward, you can forget about all the other things that matter um, in terms of, of, of changing our industry for the better. So you will see um, on the splash screens from, uh, that you'll see circulating through the, the, all the TVs during the, the week, um, where to throw your your trash basically um, they, it's always complicated it's like you can recycle this you can compost that this goes into the landfill so we've put that in a slide we've put also illustrations by the actual bins um, that's also something we're paying very close attention to as part of the kitchen challenges um, so if you follow the photos you should be doing okay and rest assured that we are paying very close attention to those issues 
Um, I want to now um, introduce our um, uh, culinary session of the day. Um, we wanted to make sure that this Global Plan Forward Culinary Summit represented the whole spectrum of what Plan Forward mean, means. Um, that it is produce focused, of course, but that also it includes meat as a condiment and that it's not about banning one, um, one thing, that it's about being comprehensive. And it's also about vegan consumers. Um, so this coming session presents all of these different uh, facets. We have someone who will be very focused on the raw ingredients. We'll have one of the world's leading vegan chefs, and we will have um, one of our own um, chefs presenting, talking about meat as a condiment. So to introduce this session, um, I will ask Sam Utches, who is the award-winning editorial director of Food News Media, our partner for the QSR Plan Forward list that you saw. Um, he will talk more about that session, the, about that list in particular tomorrow morning. There will also be a panel about um, that list. Um, but here here today uh, for this particular session in his capacity as a media moderator, and it's my great pleasure to welcome our friend Sam Oches to the podium. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, again, my, I am Sam. Uh, I'm the editorial director of Food News Media. We publish QSR and FSR, um, and as uh, Greg mentioned earlier and Anne just mentioned as well, we are honored to partner with the CIA on the uh, QSR CIA Plant Forward Fast Casual Watch List. Say that five times fast. Uh, I've been saying it a lot in my dreams lately, but when looking at it too many times. Um, but I will talk more about that tomorrow. We're really excited to uh, make that live today. Uh, but first, right now, what we're going to do is jump into putting this into practice and seeing how these Plant Forward uh, menus can actually be uh, uh, cooked in innovative ways for exciting uh, new ideas. Uh, our first uh, chef who's going to be coming out here is Chef Aaron Kiefer. Uh, as a culinary gardener for the French Laundry, uh, Chef Aaron, he grows and harvests specialty vegetables for Chef Thomas Keller's uh, the French Laundry, Bouchon Ad Hoc La Calenda, and Bouchon Bakery in Yontville. Uh, Aaron collaborates on a daily basis with the culinary teams to ensure that they receive the best produce. Uh, after graduating from the CIA in Hyde Park, he moved to California and honed his skills under several uh, of the Bay Area's top chefs. Uh, he became executive chef at the Marin Country Club, later promoted food and beverage director. Uh, but his desire to continue to learn uh, led him to do the kitchen trail at the French Laundry, uh, and part of his training involved spending time in the culinary garden, as Chef Keller believes that everybody needs an understanding and respect for where the food comes from. Uh, the immersion rekindled his connection uh, to cooking, and, uh, but it transitioned him into farming in 2009. Accepting the position of culinary gardener in January 2013, uh, Aaron continues to strive on a daily basis to make improvements upon the quality of produce, soil, and the grounds in order to supply chefs with the very best ingredients. And with that, uh, I welcome Chef Aaron Kiefer uh, to, the, uh, to the stage. Thank you, everybody. Uh, great to meet you. So my background, of course, is is in food, but before that I was a farmer. My first farm stand was when I was seven. My first job was, was when I was five. Both my grandparents were farmers and I used to pick Japanese beetles off of uh, the, the raspberry plants of my grandfather, drop them into a cup of kerosene and then present them to him. I get half a penny per beetle. And I would make just enough to, make, to get a candy bar when I was five and then just run off and go fishing or something. So, um, you know, through hay bales, um, that was my background, farming. And then when I was 17, I went in the kitchen. I thought I had struck gold. I was inside. They fed me. I, th I thought I, had, I made it. Um, I kind of worked for a little bit um, as a chef. I moved my way up in a local uh, – I grew up in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region. And I moved my way up in a uh, local winery. We did about 400 people a day. And so I was an executive chef at age 20 and didn't know anything. You know, I was kind of teaching myself. And after one disastrous night, I decided that I need to learn from somebody else, and I applied to the CIA, went to the CIA. Graduated from there and came out to California because everything I was cooking with was coming from California. So I said, oh, let me go check out this place, and uh, never left. After I came out here, I was like, this is the best of all worlds. You have sports, weather, and the best food in the world. 
So I've been here for quite some time as a chef for 17 years um, after I graduated from uh, the CIA. And then I transitioned back out into farming. And really, we have a lot of products that we push out of the French Laundry Culinary Garden. You know, we, 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 it's like three bears. For the French Laundry, we give them everything that they need. We have up to 200 products in the summer. And they get their pick of the litter. And then it moves on down to Bouchon and Ad Hoc. And then we have a new restaurant called uh, La Clenda. It's a Oaxacan restaurant. It's kind of fun. Um, I was able to fly down to Oaxaca and pick up some seeds. I have chili de agua, pepicha, copolo, all these herbs, and, and we'll be growing for, the, for them this year too. Um, so we're going to talk about what we do there and, and our focus and how we give something that the chefs can't buy. Um, and so what we do is we grow for flavor there. Better flavor in the source ingredients makes better chefs. Of course, chefs have all the technique in the world, and they can make product better. You know, they change the product chemically through time and temperature, but you can't change the essence of that product. And so what we try to do is give them the best product possible when it walks in the door. You can't turn straw into gold. So you have the best product in the world, um, you're going to be a better chef off right off the bat as soon as you get that in your, in your door. And flavor is nutrition. We kind of co-evolved with these plants. And so the best tool in the kitchen, of course, is our, is our tongue. If you can taste what's better as a chef, then you can pass that on to your, to your um, customers. You know, of course, maybe they don't have the training you do or the or experience you do, so they don't really understand why that meal is so much better than what they can cook at home. But, you know, as a chef, you know, it all starts with the source ingredients. And every chef is concentrated on proteins. Everybody knows about steaks. Everybody knows about the fish. But we are kind of coming around and saying, you know, the vegetables really do make a difference. And so the first building block of flavor, there's three for us, for, for me, how I grow. First building block of flavor is, of course, genetics. And so when you have seven different breeders of German Shepherds, you might have seven different dogs. They might be of a different weight, different color, different temperament, and plants are the same way. And so I'm very careful of how I select my genetics. Um, I've, I've kind of worked with a lot of different um, places, and so the same varietal can be a different product from a different company. I select for flavor, something that's good for our climate and that has genetic stability. Because a lot of the smaller companies, they don't have the R&D that you can, you can have with a bigger company. And so when you plant 100 seeds, you might have 20% that are kind of wonky. And so different companies are better with different products. Um, you know, commercial breeders, they select for looks, yield, and shipability. Has anybody gotten in a fender bender lately? Low, low under 50 miles an hour? Just a little bit of a, a crash, yeah? Okay, so it probably cost you or your insurance company thousands of dollars, right, to fix your car. So commercial tomatoes, what we pour out of the can when we make tomato sauce, they're bred for a 15-mile-per-hour impact. <laughs> so our car can't take that, but the tomatoes can. And when you see them going down the freeway in, in California, you have these tractor trailers piled, and, and at the bottom it must be tons of pressure but they can't be juiced down there. You have to actually have a tomato to process in tomato sauce. So we're not breeding for what we used to breed for. We bred for nutrition, and nutrition is flavor. My seed sources start, um, you know, locally, and they go all around. Uh, you know, I have farmer friends that I get my seeds from. I travel, and I find new stuff. Like I said, I just went to Oaxaca, picked up chili d'agua, some pepicha, and some uh, cilantro creo. Johnny's Selected Seeds is like the Whole Foods of the seed companies. Um, they're great. They have so many products, and they do a great job selecting. Row 7 is a brand new seed company. Probably everybody's heard about it. Dan's, Dan Barber's new seed company. They're doing some great stuff, and they're breeding for not only flavor, which all the heirlooms always have, but they're also breeding for shipability and yield. And the third, third part of that is disease resistance. So um, they're doing a great job. You know, they've released, I think, seven seeds last year, and they're doing some more this year. That research on those seeds started about 15 years ago. It takes a long time to get something to market. So it's, it's not overnight. Baker Creek Seed Company has done a great job going around the world and picking up seeds. Um, 
Kitazawa is who I use for all my Asian bridles. Seed Savers Exchange has been doing a great job since the 70s. A lot of farmers are reaching, you know, maybe the seventh generation here, fifth generation here in the U.S., and they have something that they've been growing throughout their entire family history, but their kids aren't growing anymore. The average age of the farmer is going up and up and up. I think it's 67 right now. So um, their kids don't want to farm. It's a, it's a tough life, and there's no money in it anymore. So what they're doing, uh, uh, Seed Savers Exchange, they're taking the uh, heirloom varieties that these farmers may have, their ancestors may have brought from the old country, wherever it is, and they're saving them. And they have a 1,000-acre um, place out in Iowa, and they'll separate it so they can isolate the, the genetics, and they'll, they'll store it in an underground, uh, underground vault that's kept at a freezing temperature, kind of like our, everybody's heard of the global you know, disaster vault up in Norway. So it's, it's kind of like that. We have, we have one here in the U.S., and they also send their seeds off to Norway. Um, so that's kind of where I get my seed, uh, seed sources from. So you can you feel free to write those down. They're great seed sources. Um, the, next, the next step of flavor is soil. And so dirt is what you find under your fingernails. That's it. It's just dirt. It's not soil. Completely different product. Soil is a combination of organics, air, and mycorrhizal, you know, fungal network. So um, what we do for soil is we kind of add a lot of organics to our soil. And you can see how rich and beautiful it is. You know, in that soil is tons and tons of life. There's more life in two tablespoons of soil than Manhattan, if you count up all the little organisms. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of amazing, but if you go down deep enough, there is more life in that soil. Beneficial nematodes, mycorrhizae, rhizoba, beneficial bacteria. And so my approach is I add organics, I boost life in the soil with worm casting tea and compost tea, and then I try to cre create the correct environment for that life to thrive. So you never want to let your soil get completely dry. You know, that's, that's not the environment they want. You want to keep it moist. Um, and then we just pump it full of all kinds of organics. Um, water is important. Soil testing, when you start off, is pretty important. That will remove some of the guesswork. But the best fertilizer at the end of the day is the farmer. Walking the field and taking a look at what's going on is going to be the best way of figuring out what's going on in your field. This is kind of a, a part of my recipe. I'm not going to give you the full recipe. But um, this, is, this is a lot of what I put in my soil to kind of build the organics. Um, worm castings, compost, oyster shell flour, um, which is ground up oysters. Uh, you know, oysters will break down over years, but ground up oysters will break down pretty quickly. Compost tea, worm casting tea, kelp emulsion, and fish emulsion. Both of those are more of a available nutrient. Um, so the organics I put in the soil aren't readily uptakeable by the plants, and so you need the life in the soil to break down those organics so the, the plant can uptake it. And the plant actually kind of farms what beneficial um, life it needs. It'll push out something called exudites and push out what it wants for whatever it wants to breed under, underground. And when it's all working, it's pretty beautiful. Uh, the flavor is amazing. The third step is harvesting for flavor. So you can turn golden to straw. Um, you know, most products you do want to harvest early in the morning. The sugars change throughout the day, the enzymes, flavor changes throughout the day. Um, the other thing that you want to harvest, the really reason why we want to harvest so early is uh, longevity of the product. If you look at plants like a big um, kind of bundle of tubes, almost like straws, they're constantly uptaking nutrients and water and kind of pushing it out through their, um, through their leaves, through the stomata, and they're pushing out vapor and oxygen. And if you chop it off, it doesn't, it's just like, you know, the guillotine, they don't know they're dead yet. And so they keep on doing that process. They keep on pushing it out. And so you're emptying those straws, and you really lose the turgidity of that product. So when we harvest, we'll harvest early before they kind of woken up and doing that. And then the little microgreens and the little greens will harvest and put into water right away. So as they draw that water, it'll draw water into those tubes so it retains its turgidity. And then as a chef, you can put it on a hot plate, and it's not just going to wilt immediately. Um, afternoon harvest is rare. There's only a few things I like to harvest in the afternoon. 
and that's like strawberries because they reduce uh, the water in them. And just like a glass of wine, if you add an ounce of water to a glass of wine, completely different product. Um, strawberries kind of dry out and they suck out a little bit of water. And figs, um, you know, you taste the same ripe fig in the morning and then in the afternoon, and the afternoon is absolutely stunning and delicious. And then, of course, growing in the correct season. That's the most important part. Um, you know, you don't want, I don't grow any lettuces in the, in the uh, summertime because it's too hot. It's kind of uh, bitter, you know, when you cut the lettuces and you have that white sap dripping out and it's kind of a bitter lettuce. You don't really want that. A lettuce in the summer, I can grow one in about 35 days. In the winter, it might take me 70 or 80 days to grow a head of lettuce. But there's less cellulose and it's just denser and sweeter. We're kind of going to go through the seasons a little bit and talk about what grows the best in the seasons. Spring, um, there's a shot of the farm in the spring. So peas, of course, are a great, great spring, spring crop. Favas also, and every part of that plant is edible. And we'll kind of talk about that later when we talk about one of the, uh, one of the dishes that the French Laundry is putting together with peas right now. Blossoms. Um, you know, you have peaches and nectarines uh, pushing out tons of blossoms, and they're beautiful, but they also have a great scent, right? So what we'll do is we'll harvest a lot of blossoms, and we'll steam distill it. So we'll steam it. The steam comes up. We'll capture it through a tube and kind of pull it down. Just like perfume or alcohol, we'll distill out that essence of the blossoms, and that becomes part of our dishes. It takes a lot of blossoms, so you have to have... Uh, <laughs> takes a lot of time. It's not something you normally would do. It's, it's a lot easier to uh, use uh, terpenes from a, or, or even flavors, you know. Um, edible flowers, right there in the middle, you'll see some columbine. They're native to really a lot of the temperate northern regions, but definitely native to North America. The roots, edible. The flowers are edible. They have a really nice look and flavor, and there's probably 300 different flowers. And then snails. You know, it's still wet. The snails are coming out. They're eating my products, so we eat them. <laughs> so the the brown snail is edible. So you grab it out of your um, you grab it out of your garden, and then you feed it like moistened organic um, cornmeal. They'll eat that. That pushes all of the acrid um, goo that they've been eating, all the plant material, pushes it through them. That's about three days, and then all they have inside them is uh, cornmeal. At that point in time, you can poach them and, and cook them and eat them. So that's a little bit of revenge for us. <laughs> um, summer crops. This is a solstice picture. So this is the 21st of June. Of course, when we think of summer, June is just starting, right? But for plants, June is when, OK, it's over. Because the, the light goes up, 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 up. We hit the 21st of June. By the 22nd or 23rd, the light's going away. Winter's coming. And they know that. So what they want to do is start procreating. They want to make, you know, uh, the next generation so they can survive as a species. And so you want to get all your product in early, early enough, you know, so, it, so it's going to grow, grow a big plant. And then once the 21st of June hits, you'll start to see flowers hit. And then your real production comes in July and August. And that's when they're really pushing out their fruit, which is the seed, which normally would drop and rot and, and turn into a plant for the next year. So Solcera, Solenum, the uh, big three are tomatoes, eggplant, and of course, potatoes. They're all in the same family. They're all from Central America. When everybody thinks of uh, Italian food, you think of like, you know, tomato sauce. And, and uh, you know, they're, they didn't have that until Columbus discovered the New World. So it's kind of interesting that what our basis of a lot of our food is came from the New World. It's completely different. Um, but they're all heat lovers because they are from Central America, and we'll, we'll produce tons. One seed, which is this big, of tomatoes, will eventually produce about 50 to 70 pounds of tomatoes off of one plant, is if you grow it right, if you start at the right time. And the tomato season for me starts in, um, back in February. I start my tomato seeds around February 9th. I grow them up in a, in a controlled environment in the hoop house and uh, put them in the soil. Right about now, the soil temperature's up there. So they're heat lovers, and water management is really important too. So we talked about a glass of wine 
and how much water, how, how little water kind of changes uh, the flavor of a glass of wine. It changes the flavor of tomatoes too. So I'll shut the water off completely on my tomatoes for two days before I harvest. I'll harvest and then turn the, the water on for a day. And then once again, shut it off for a couple of days. That does two things. It concentrates the flavor. And also when you have a ripe tomato and you give it a little water, first thing it's gonna do is split. So um, water management is important for spring crops or summer crops. Fall time, um, the, the balloons that are all over Napa. So cold sensitive brassicas. So some brassicas can withstand the cold, some brassicas can't. Like um, uh, cauliflower has a hard time making it through a hard frost. Everything else will withstand it. Carrots are delicious, saltus is delicious, beets, turnips, winter radish, but you have to plant your product for the, for the fall early enough because if it doesn't kind of form a head or create a root by the time you hit a 11 or 10 hour day, then you'll never, you're never going to create any sort of product. It'll kind of live through winter because it will withstand the frost, but then it's just going to bolt and you're never going to get a product. So you've just spent months growing something and you get nothing out of it. And then winter. So this is California. I don't know where you're all from, but, um, you know. I, used, I grew up in New York, so I can make that joke. Uh, this, is, this is a lot nicer. Um, winter crops. So there's a, there's a celeriac. I start that one in, in March. I'll put it in the ground in May. And we don't harvest till after first frost. Um, a lot of these winter crops, we have to protect them if it gets too cold. Anything under 27 kind of knocks them back. But frost is our friend because what these plants do, just like salt water freezes at a lower temperature, sugar water does too. So these plants, to protect themselves from the frost, will kind of push out some extra carbohydrates and they grow slower and denser. The product in the winter is one of my favorite. I mean, it's so much better in flavor um, and sweeter, denser and, and more tender. So what chefs want, Best tool in the kitchen, of course, is your tongue. Second best is communication. We constantly communicate with them. I sit down with them for seasonal meetings. I sit down with all the seed seed catalogs, and we kind of plan out the next the next um, um, crop. And we also talk about the failures or what we want to reduce or increase for the next year. Um, daily communication. We communicate with them daily. We give them a daily list, and I'm in the kitchen three, four times a day talking to the chefs about what they want. And what chefs really want is something new. And it doesn't have to be something they've never seen. It can be the first tomato of the season, or it can be the, the beautiful lettuce that comes in when it's frost kissed. But certainly they want something new because you know the creative process is, is kind of a wonky thing. You never know what's gonna make you inspired. And something new always helps. So. Um, trends for 2019, tropical peppers without the heat, habanada, ahi dulces. Sprouting cauliflower is uh, this new thing. Anybody who's grown cauliflower before knows if you wait a little long enough, it does sprout, but somehow that's become the, the hot thing. Um, oxalis, of course, I grow, I think, seven different kinds of oxalis out there. Um, pine berries, Salanova lettuce. Um, it has seven bracts instead of four. Saltus, and of course, CBD. <laughs> um, you know, marijuana has been a trend since Woodstock, but CBD is the new hot thing. I guess it's a snake oil or it cures everything, depending on who you talk to. Um, but it's put, be, be being put in food right now. Um, new, new products are chosen through travel seed catalogs. And uh, of course, Instagram, you can travel without going any place. Has farm to table, jump the shark. This is a, uh, this is a photo from IHOP. <laughs> and, it, and all food comes from a farm someplace, right? So it really is farm to table. Everything's farm to table. But what kind of farm are you growing? Here's a, one of our items off the menu. Um, the garden key leaf salad with Chantenay carrots, preserved Meyer lemon, and toasted chickpea hummus. Um, so here's the pea plant over on the left. And that has everything that we harvest, which is in my hand, for the pea salad, which is there. Um, next up is the young fennel bulb a la grec, celery ranch, Davignon radishes, compressed Belgian endive. And that's the base product, and that's the final dish. So my red light's on. I'm out of time. I'm probably over time. So thank you so much for coming out.
Thank you, Aaron. All right, next up, uh, Chef Tal Ronan is the founder and chef of Crossroads Kitchen in Los Angeles. Uh, West, Holly neighbor, West Hollywood uh, neighborhood, and he's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Conscious Cook, and also Crossroads, Extraordinary Recipes from the Restaurant That is Reinventing Vegan Cuisine. Uh, Tall is the co-creator of Kite Hill, board member for Impossible Foods. He first became known nationwide as the chef who prepared meals for Oprah Winfrey's 21-Day Vegan Cleanse, and he further made his culinary mark at a number of high-profile profile events, including uh, having catered Ellen DeGeneres and Portia de Rossi's wedding, a U.S. Senate dinner, and more. Uh, Tal is a graduate of the National Gourmet Institute, and he is also a collaborating chef for all 12 restaurants at the Wynn and Encore Hotels in Las Vegas. Chef Tal uh, Ronan, please come on out. Hi, everyone. All right, how is everybody? Good, good. So uh, I'm not a great speaker, so I'm a little more comfortable uh, cooking, so this is a good fit. Um, but I'm looking forward to spending a couple of days with you guys. And um, today we're going to dive into uh, vegan pasta making. And um, I don't know, is the slideshow going while I'm, or do I need to advance it? Yeah, I was just going to show a little bit. Um, so Crossroads is in West Hollywood, and um, we were certainly not the first vegan restaurant in L.A., um, but we were the first to uh, combine more fi a fine dining atmosphere, a full bar, and um, a real theme to the cuisine. Instead of just different cuisines mashed up together, uh, we focus on Mediterranean cuisine. Um, I was born in Israel, so it's um, very uh, familiar ingredients. Um, we have a great pasta program, and that's what I'm going to show you today. So uh, we do all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, these are little gnocchettis that we make, um, little tortellinis. You can see the size of my pinky there. They're tiny, and you can imagine if you need you know, 20, 30 of those per order, they take some time to make. Um, raviolo, uh, in the middle you have a, a yellow tomato bernays turned into a egg yolk. Uh, the ricotta cheese is made from almond milk uh, by a company I uh, co-founded called Kite Hill, so it's cultured almond milk. Um, different shapes, we use a lot of old school hand tools, um, but also sheeters. Uh, we have a small extruder, the annulotti, uh, and the picture is, I think, from the Crossroads Cookbook. So if you guys are interested in these recipes, uh, they're in the book. And yeah, any shape, size, uh, we make it. Um, we also try and do different builds that are interesting. So if you look at this, you might be thinking, hmm, how are those clams, right? How is so... We, we make a kombu stock with uh, yellow oyster mushrooms. It really adds that ocean flavor. And if you guys are around tomorrow, uh, my workshop tomorrow is focused solely on how to get ocean flavor into plant-based cooking. And today we'll be making this, the fettuccine uh, with morels. Summer we do sweet corn annulotti tortellonis, hand-rolled garganelli, and our carbonara is probably our best-selling one. Um, probably sell about 40, 45 orders a night of those. So, And uh, this is a great shot of Mama Katerina, my friend's mother from New York, who comes uh, twice a year to L.A. and uh, rolls pasta with us. So. With that, uh, I'll get going. Um, the first thing we're going to do is make a dough. And um, when I was developing this recipe, I was thinking about how to replace um, the yolk in pasta, the functionality of the egg yolk, um, the saturated fat in the egg yolk, how it emulsifies. So um, we're starting with silken tofu. And this is red palm oil. Uh, it's African, so it's sustainably harvested. I know there's some problems with red palm oil uh, coming from Asia. And that's going to give us a nice yolky color. 
a pinch of salt and uh, a little bit of water. And we'll spin this to create our yolk. Not sure what kind of view you guys have, but it's uh, pretty yolky looking. <laughs> Let's see if we need to tilt it out. Does that help? Oh, okay, good. Uh, I'm going to go in half semolina, half double zero. And we're going to let the RoboCoop do our kneading for us. And you want to get this going until the blade starts to catch a ball. And we're going to add some more of the flour. And I'm just going to reserve a little bit at the end, depending on how hydrated the dough is. All right, cool. So you see the ball forming? Normally, I'd keep this on for a minute or two and let it uh, knead. And uh, that's our dough. And we have one over here that's been resting. So hopefully we have enough room here. We'll uh, roll some of this out. Thank you. I'll keep a little bit of this flour. So I'm going to just stretch this out so it'll go through our sheeter here. And we'll open this up to the widest setting. And give it a fold. And we can start working it through uh, one step at a time on the sheeter. I'm going to give it a couple more folds just to build a little structure. Cool, that's looking good. Uh, if we had more room, like our traditional workbench at the restaurant, we wouldn't have to cut it. We could go really far. But I'm just, just for now, I'll uh, run this through and then we'll attach the cutter. And it's a, a very mo moist dough, so you might need to keep flouring it. And we'll go one more, and then we'll head to the cutter. Cool. Thank you. OK. 
Okay. So we're going to cut the sheet. Um, at the restaurant, we use a much wider sheeter, so you can actually portion your pasta ahead of time by the length of the cut. So you can imagine a little wider sheet would give you a full portion. And through uh, a little bit of help, we have some already made. And there it is. So as you guys can see, I'm not a big talker. I wish there were like questions to keep this going. But uh, OK, great. That would be awesome. Uh, so, Chef, uh, tell us about, uh, well, let's see. <laughs> Pretty straightforward what we got going here. Uh, what was the process that happened between what you were making now and this pasta here? Did you have to let it sit out for a while? Yeah, you want to let okay. it dry out. And this dough is great uh, for filled pasta as well. If you're doing annulotis, tortellinis, um, it works great. And uh, you can freeze them, too portion them and freeze them. Great. Um, so before I drop this in, I'm just going to start a little quick pan sauce. Uh, we have some olive oils. We're going to saute some morels. Wait for that pan to heat up. Uh, some asparagus. And um, these are beautiful, by the way. Thank you for whoever found these. You got the crowd's attention with that one. Thank you. <laughs> I've never seen a crowd ooh and awe mushrooms like that. <laughs> That's right. So I'm going to help Sam because I have a couple of questions. Can you describe the flavor of the pasta and how that might compare to the flavor of an egg-based pasta? Can you repeat that? Sorry, it's hard um, to hear. What does the pasta taste like compared to an egg-based pasta? Because it, it looks very similar. Yeah, it's, you, it's indistinguishable. Yeah. Um, so we've got some shallots going in. And we'll add our asparagus. Where did that go? There it is. And the pasta cooks really fast, so I'm going to wait till this gets sautéed a little more. And just some salt and pepper somewhere around. Uh, there we go. <laughs> and... Um, with morels and asparagus and being spring, I wanted to do something very delicate. So we're going to um, deglaze this with a little Prosecco and then uh, a little vegetable stock and cream it out with um, uh, something called earth balance. Um, we know butter's not good for us and we know margarine's not good for us. So this is, this is a product that's made out of expeller pressed oils that's... Um, you know, fairly good. Um, my company, Kite Hill, is now working on a lot of dairy substitutes, but there are a lot of other companies that make really great products out there. And um, there's no shortage of uh, good substitutions. So I'm going to drop the fettuccine in. And we would normally want to get a little more color on this, but. Uh, just for time's sake, we'll finish that up. So Prosecco. We'll stock. And th this is uh, nutritional yeast flakes. It's going to add a little cheesy flavor to the sauce. And uh, as soon as that pasta is ready, we'll cream that out and plate it up for you. 
And how long normally does that pasta need to, to cook it's for? It's about ready, a minute or two. Oh, very yeah, fast. Very quick. Yeah. Did you try other processes before arriving to the tofu as your, because there are a lot of bean-based pasta, for example, now. So what, yeah, what might you, you have tried? Some, some pastas, if you're using an extruder, you don't even need uh, the egg substitute. If you look at an extruded pasta that you buy at a store, it's just semolina and water. And that's the same if you're doing it at the, at the restaurant they're making. So we make fresh spaghetti, um, fettuccine, every shape, size. If it's going through the extruder, it's just semolina and, and uh, water. So. All right, I think we're there. Let's see what this looks like. <laughs> All right. Um, normally, if that water had been used for about an hour, that starchiness could also really help pull this sauce together. So we could grab a little more, but I think we're good. And that's it, guys. This is our uh, us made fettuccine with morels and asparagus. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Chef Tall. Appreciate that. Uh, so our final speaker for today uh, is Chef Barbara Alexander. Uh, she's a consulting chef for the CIA, uh, authoring a new curriculum uh, for the CIA in plant-forward cuisine. For more than 30 years, she's worked as a professional executive chef, running hotel kitchens and Michelin-level restaurants in Vancouver, Canada, and Sydney, Australia. Uh, Barbara left the restaurant business to become a culinary educator uh, with the De Brule, am I saying that right? De Brule French Culinary School in Vancouver, uh, the CIA at Greystone, and a 16-year stint as the culinary director at the Lauded Napa Valley Cooking School. Uh, Barbara holds degrees in English literature and journalism and is a certified executive chef and certified hospitality educator from the American Culinary Federation. And on top of all of that, she is an avid traveler and partner in a culinary travel and tour opera operation, leading bespoke culinary adventures in the Napa Valley and worldwide. Please welcome Chef Barbara. Thank you so much. There we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm excited to have this beautiful lady helping me, Joy, who's a, a mainstay in our kitchens upstairs. Um, Welcome, everybody. This is a really exciting moment for me. Um, this is the first of, our, of these conferences, and um, being part of the authoring uh, this curriculum, I'm really quite excited. I'm going to do two uh, recipes today. I'm quite a talker, so hopefully <laughs> I don't need any help, but uh, you never know. So I'm going to do a, a breakfast bowl this, morning, uh, th this afternoon, and we um, have focused this on meat as a condiment. So there is meat in this breakfast bowl. It's um, less than 30 percent, uh, but it, we're, we're heading in a direction where we are uh, borrowing from global storerooms to introduce a great flavor, in, and this is a breakfast bowl. Honestly, I make it at home all the time, um, and I actually eat it for dinner, so it really is one of those things can, that can go any, any way. So the very first thing we're going to do, and obviously, I mean, it's quite apparent that I'm not Moroccan, so I want to be uh, clear that I think with Gen Z and the millennials that it's very important that we're being uh, transparent, not necessarily 100% authentic. So I'm, I think in the, in, the, uh, in the essence of getting that flavor packed in in the morning, it's, it's really a good idea to just borrow from the global storeroom. So we're going to do a deep dive into that. So I've got a little um, Moroccan spice paste that I'm going to start with. And um, I have uh, some carrot, uh, onion, garlic, and then some razzle hanou, smoked paprika, and Aleppo pepper. A little bit of preserved lemon to finish it, add a little salt so that we don't have to add too much additional sodium. And we're going to add to that, um, while my 
pans heating up here, we're going to add to that a, a couple of other products to cut that meat so that meat then becomes the condiment. And what we're going to use today is I've got a chickpea pasta, um, which is uh, branded as chickpea rice. So it looks like rice. It's a little bit more like orzo. Um, and I'm also going to put some kidney beans in. I always think kidney beans are the sort of unsung hero of the bean world, um, only because when I grew up, they were on every single salad bar, and they seem to have sort of dissipated into the, into the nether regions of beans. Um, and I'm really pro-kidney bean. I love them. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to add them. What I really like about them is they mimic the texture of meat without... Um, without, and you don't need to crush them too much, but they really, without changing the color, they really blend in well with the meat. So we're going to start off by making this paste. A little bit of carrot, some onion, some garlic. We're just going to cook that down gently. And then to that, we're going to add a little paste. Now, I know that sometimes when we're doing these demos, there's some folks in the audience that for, are from very large scale operations. And we're plating these cute little dishes. And I just want to let you know that this can be made in bulk. It doesn't need to be chopped beautifully by hand like whomever did that did it. Um, it can all obviously be done in large machinery. Uh, the paste itself can be made and kept. I keep it in a little tub in my, in my refrigerator. Keeps for a couple of weeks. Um, so it can be done in advance. And all of this can be done in really large scale um, proportions. So I don't want to make it look like I'm just plating this little tiny bowl but we are just doing a little tiny bowl. And then I think there's even tinier bowls outside for you to try. So um, I'm going to add some Raza Hanou. I'm really happy about this Raz because it came back with my business partner from Morocco. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And then we're going to add a little bit of uh, smoked paprika to this just to enhance that smokiness and some Aleppo pepper, which, of course, I love. And I've... I've um, in my household, it's gotten to the point where I think people are starting to kind of want to hide the Aleppo pepper because it's in everything that I, that I do. But we always go through all these phases. So I'll add a little Aleppo. It's not too spicy, which is nice. And I want to cook that down before I add that preserved lemon. I really like the preserved lemon to be added at the end again. Is it authentic? I don't know. Is it transparent? Yes. Um, I like to add it at the end because I like to preserve that freshness of flavor. Well, hello there. I just saw you out of the corner of my eye. And I'm going to add that little bit of preserved lemon in. Thanks, Joy. You can take all those away. That'd be great. So once we have this paste cooked down, we can then um, use that in so many different ways to flavor things. We've built up a really deep layered flavor, which is what we're looking for, um, so that it can complement the lamb, but not, uh, we don't want the lamb to overpower it. And especially in this domain, we want to be able to cut that lamb with another protein. As chefs, I keep running into this, as chefs, we say protein, meaning animal flesh. And we, even as chefs, we have to get ourselves away from that and start calling other things proteins as well. So we've got this very protein-packed base to our bowl. We've got a, um, a, a chickpea rice, and we also have kidney beans. So we're packing in protein at sort of every level, and then we're enhancing it here with the smoky, uh, with the smoky really flavorful base. So I'm going to add to that my lamb. And um, like I said, I cook the lamb in advance, but I would like to add less than a third of the lamb to our dish. And I'm going to also add in the chickpea rice and the kidney beans. And now, and I started doing this at home even with my kid, you know, in, in tacos or, or whatever. And sometimes it goes completely unnoticed, which I think is sort of kind of a drag for me as a chef. But it's really good that my child is eating a third of the meat that she once was. So... Um, but I, you know, sometimes I want her to notice that I have a special bean in there or, or whatever. Now it tends to stick a little bit, so we're just going to add a little bit of water to that, and that's going to be the base of our bowl. I know you've seen a million bowls before. I'm not, no, I'm not breaking any new ground here, but I think that the combo of these flavors, as well as allowing 
that meat to be a very small part of the bowl still gives you that pack of flavor. And it's really, I hope you can smell it because it's always pretty tasty. So a little bit of salt. I, I've made this a number of times. Uh, just a tiny bit of salt. There's already the preserved lemon in there. And we're going to move on to the other components. So I'm just going to let that warm through while we talk through a little bit of our other components. Um, actually, word on the street upstairs in the kitchen is I have too many elements in my demos. Um, so just bear with me here for a few minutes. Um, and please don't say anything to anybody that's like the powers that be because apparently there's just too many things going on here. Um, I uh, have some poached eggs, very simply poached eggs. Of course, that could be a really nice 62 degree egg or a sous vide egg. It could be um, any number of things for ease and simplicity and volume catering. I have a tahini yogurt with pomegranate molasses in it. Um, See, uh, even me, me, as I'm starting to list this off, I'm like, okay, there is a lot of ingredients. Um, but uh, but well, let's just, just indulge me for a sec. So then I have a, a whole selection of, of Middle Eastern herbs. I've got mint and fennel tops, uh, some fresh chervil parsley leaves, and of course, pomegranate, some avocado, and also some charred tomatoes. So I just flung these tomatoes underneath the broiler, a little bit of olive oil on top of them. And of course, you know, they're on the branch, so they're extra sexy, but um, they of course don't have to be on the branch. Once this warms through, we'll go ahead and plate up and just put this little meal together. Uh, just one a slightly larger spoon, that'll be good. The, the bowl is sexy, I know. Um, it's actually made by a local potter, so millennials love all that kind of stuff. And I realize that for large-scale catering, it's not exactly a reasonable idea. However, if Google gave my potter friend the contract, I'm sure they'd be absolutely thrilled. Um, this is actually locally made pottery. It is locally made pottery. So I'm going to take my nice poached egg, place that on top, and a couple of scoops of avocado. Just very casually plopped on there. We have our tahini yogurt sauce. Let's grab another spoon. A little bit of tahini yogurt sauce on there. Just need a little just, uh, spot to land. And I'm going to put my herbs together. And the one last thing that I haven't really talked about is I started uh, working with kidney beans um, and sort of trying to think about different ways to utilize them that they haven't been used so far. And one of the things I found that was amazing with kidney beans is they dry out like just as well, if not better, than chickpeas in the oven. And they're, I love chickpeas too, but in this particular case, I started trying to think about a facon bit and um, developed a recipe with the bean folks for um, putting a little bit of uh, smoke to these, smoking the kidney beans a little at first, and then a little bit of maple syrup and some salt and drying them out in the oven and they come out almost identical to bacon bits. So I'm like really pretty excited about that. And if someone markets that, it'd be really great to you know give me a, a couple of bucks on the side. <laughs> so I'm gonna put a little bit of fresh salad on there. I just love the look of fresh herbs. They are just always so beautiful. On a, on a dish and wonderful at lunch, breakfast, and then we'll put a little branch of our tomatoes. Have I got it all, Joy? A little bit of harissa to finish the dish. So I, I realize that not everybody's going to do this for large volume catering, um, but I think that the elements are there and that the, any of those elements could be used. Of course, it looks really sexy when you cut the egg yolk open, so we can do that a little bit later if someone's going to catch that for a photo. Some bacon bits at the end. They're not actually, these ones are pistachios and dried, um, the, uh, the dried kidney beans with pistachios. You'll try them outside. Um, roasted pistachios and a little bit of Razel Hanu in there. So that is our breakfast bowl. If you could set me up with everything for the carrot right here, it would be great. But I'm not done. So we're going to do one more. <laughs> we're going to do one more little dish. Um, we've got six minutes, so we're good. 
Um, if you could indulge me with a tiny little story for a second. And I told the story last time, and then I told everybody in the kitchen, we're never doing this carrot dish again. And so you won't have to listen to this again, I promise you. But um, I grew up in Vancouver, Canada, and um, quite frankly, it was very white, very middle class, um, and it's cold in the winter. And um, I grew up with hippie parents. But they weren't the cool hippies that immediately pop into your mind. They didn't have a VW, they didn't wear cool clothes, they didn't smoke pot, and they didn't dress in cool and funky clothing. They were what I would call totally straight hippies. But what was, and I don't even know if that's a thing, but my parents were the exemplary model of it. And um, I'm not sure what exactly it was about them that makes me say that they were hippies, except that we were recycling gray water. We had a garden planted out the back. My dad built solar ovens. This is back in the 70s, 60s. Um, and so um, my mom uh, was in our neighborhood that was fairly upper class, and all the ladies played tennis. But they didn't like going to the store that my mom and dad shopped at, which was the organic co-op, which was highly unusual. So my mom, I think, actually became the first purveyor of the CSA box. Um, she would pack up the vegetables from the hippies down at the commune, and she would bring them to the tennis skirt playing ladies in Carisdale, the area I grew up in. Um, and so I grew up in this bizarre sort of environment with my parents doing these weird things that it was really pretty weird for like a 10, 12-year-old kid. And it, it created this tiny little love story that's kind of sad. Um, I loved carrots as a young child, but as my mom got further and further into this, and because we were living in Vancouver, Canada, there was very little in the winter except carrots and cabbage and beets. So I saw a lot of carrots through my youth, and my mom would use the carrot tops in salad, or put them in soup, which we thought was super weird. And she would never peel the carrots. That was unheard of in our house. And sometimes you'd go to school and open up your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and there was a layer of carrots inside it. Like, sometimes it was creative and crushed, and other times it was just jammed in there, like a couple of whole pieces of carrot. So um, I hated carrots. I really hated carrots. And then I merged uh, many years later into the culinary world, and I worked in very fine dining restaurants, and I threw out more carrot tops and more carrot peels, and more tops of carrots, and roots of carrots, than, than I probably threw up my body weight in those things. And I had the, this deep sense of guilt about it, even though I still, frankly, hated them. Um, so I'm doing a carrot dish today. In honor of my mom, and in honor of all the carrots that I have tortured and disposed of, I have decided that I'm going to come to grips with them, and, and this is the second time I've done this at this conference, but I am going to do a little carrot root to stem thing. So it was fun to listen to the gardener, Aaron, speak of it. And so I started to think a little bit about different ways to create deliciousness, create craveability, and create umami in something as simple or as abhorrent as a carrot. So, um, you know what, I kind of, I, I hate to... So we had a big divorce, Carrots and I, um, but, but I've, I've sort of come back to that place where we're now talking again. So, um, so it's all good, but uh, I did a little dish today, very simple. I'm, I'm, I have no intention of you going out there and repeating this dish. I really am just kind of coming to grips on a personal level with carrots, but also trying to show you that there are so many components that we can use from a simple vegetable, be it a celery root, be it a piece of celery, the underrated vegetable, to something as simple as a carrot. So I have, you may have seen it before, this is not my idea, um, but, but I really love it. I've done some coffee roasted carrots, so they, and, and there's no lie here for the chefs in the audience, they realized she did not cook those in that dish, so full disclosure and transparency, no, you're right, I moved them to the dish. Um, because Joy told me if I used the dish in the oven, that all hell was going to break out. Uh, so I've just tossed them very lightly in olive oil and salt and pepper. And then you heat the coffee beans first, and they can be used multiple times, so it's not wasteful. Um, they can be used many, many times, and the oils from the coffee are so fragrant that if you keep a lid on top of it, it's essentially like smoking something, the coffee beans permeate the flavor of the carrots. The one thing is, you must peel them, because if you don't peel them, 
well, my mom would love you. But if you don't peel them, what happens is they, they don't uh, 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 pull that flavor into them. So creating layers of deliciousness, um, we have to peel those carrots. But we're going to use them over here in a crispy carrot. So we've got them. They can be dehydrated. They can also... Um, they can be dehydrated or they can simply um, be deep fried. So we're just going to grab our plate. Perfect. Another gorgeous plate. Thank you. And um, we're going to just do a little uh, plate presentation. So I'll talk about the components. Like I said, I have no intention of you plating this up like this. The idea is really that I'm making some components that are quite simply sound really fun, sound exotic, taste really great, deliciousness. Um, this dish is not vegan because there's yogurt, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a sec. So I have a vegan uh, carrot puree, um, and this is a smoked carrot. So we smoke the carrots first, and again, you must peel them or that pellicle on the outside of the carrots will prevent any smoke flavor from enhancing it. And you have to also be careful that you get them right at a nice level of smokiness before they become too smoky tasting. So I think with vegetables and smoking, that's an important feature. So we have our, uh, our carrot puree, which we're going to just um, put on our plate. And we have the carrot top pesto. Uh, sorry, the carrot, um, the carrot um, uh, puree is made with cashew milk. So same thing here. We're going to put a little bit of the, of the, of the uh, pesto on there. And then I have a seasoned yogurt. So I always like to just use it. This could be soy yogurt. It could be any, anything vegan. If you wanted to keep it that way, it would be completely fine. And then uh, we are going to pinch our carrots here. I just make sure that the coffee beans are off uh, because hitting one of those is a little surprise. And someone asked me last time, why don't... <laughs> Sorry? There's one in there? That was a chef who announced that, I'm sure. <laughs> don't worry, no one's going to eat this, so we're okay. The ones upstairs definitely don't have them on there. And just don't be too, too picky about it. The, um, the pickled carrots, very simply, scatter them around. Uh, they were just um, very simply um, pickling liquid hot over raw carrots. We'll give them a couple of those. So just building different flavors, finding a point where we're tasting the carrot in its different, it, different guises, each one of these components being useful on its own. Uh, meat is a garnish. So we can't make this vegan if we're going to do this, but it can be done without it. This is a savory oatmeal. Um, I'm really into savory oatmeal. I just love the texture and the flavor. It has um, oats in it. But I've also done it very successfully with red lentils um, instead of the oats. So if, there's, uh, if you're trying to go down that direction, it works great. But using meat as a garnish, we just have a little bit of bacon in there. And so that kind of lends itself quite well to that coffee flavor as well. I found some pretty things in the garden. So we can put a few sprinkles of those on. Little bergamot flowers that came out of my garden this morning and a little bit of the crispy carrot thread. So again, just creating deliciousness and flavor, different components, roasted. Thank you for indulging my story. This is for my carrot. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Tal. Uh, Tal and Elena Regalas, who will be presenting tomorrow, are signing books tonight during the reception, which will be taking place outside. Um, with your conference badge, you get 10% off um, in the Copia restaurant, which is on this floor. Um, in the Grove restaurant, which is the terrace outside, um, they're open at the same hours. The Grove out outside stays open a little bit later. Um, and you also get 10% off in the beautiful store that is right at the uh, exit of this auditorium. That includes on the books that you can also get signed. Um, the as I mentioned before, the recipes for the dishes that are demoed are in the app. After the conference, you'll get all of the recipes that have been presented at the meals also, everything you've eaten. Um, 
conditionally to EU filling out an evaluation for some of it, so just remember to do that. Um, we will gather back here in the atrium at 7.45 tomorrow morning for breakfast. Our first session will be here tomorrow morning at 8.30. You don't want to miss it. We're going to have a wonderful panel um, exploring the business case behind Plan Forward. Um, now, I will happily release you into the wild of our reception, uh, sponsored by our Platinum and Premium Gold sponsor. Have a great evening. Hi, I'm here to talk about senior living and health care, a very important segment. Using Rich's products, operators are able to offer a variety of customizable meals, higher quality food, and provide impressive selections. Snacks are also very important to seniors. So we have a breadstick that you can make out of our Rich's pizza dough. We also have a Rich's parfait made with layers of our Rich's on top, applesauce, and our crumbled uh, Uber, which we call the ultimate breakfast round or super granola round. Also, using our six by six Rich's flatbread, you can make a caprese sandwich which is very, very appealing and tasty. You can also cut this into triangles for a shareable application. Then we also want to talk about the Rich's plant-based cooking cream. This is one of our newest products. It does not contain any of the eight allergens. It can make a vegan tomato soup. You start with a little bit of oil and sweat your vegetables till they're tender. Then you add a slurry, some vegetable broth, some crushed tomatoes and thicken that up and then you come back and finish it with the plant-based cooking cream for a creamy vegan tomato soup which goes great with breadsticks and our sandwiches. Using Rich's products you can cater to that dinner party generation and provide impressive selections. Hi, Chef Jake here from Rich's. I'm here to talk to you today about our new ready to stretch pizza dough. It's unique, authentic, versatile, and flexible. It gives you the opportunity to make beautiful artisan style pizzas by taking dough right from the refrigerator onto the screen, stretch it to the thickness you want, and then top it and bake it in whatever oven you have. We have six inch or 12 inch dough you may buy pizza dough already from Rich's and you say, well, what makes this different? What makes it different is it's ready to stretch right from the fridge. It's authentic, it's unique, and it's ready to stretch to give you that artisan pizza dough that you've been looking for for your operation for years. So let's stretch a pizza. We'll use our, our six inch, six ounce, ready to stretch pizza dough we took right from the refrigerator. This eliminates proofing so it makes it easier for the operator to use. I'll stretch our dough without even picking it up. And you can make this as thick or thin as you want. I'll, stre I'll stretch this six inch dough to about 12 inches. And even if it's not perfectly round, it gives it that rustic artisan look. So today we're gonna prepare a margarita pizza. I'll take our ready to stretch pizza dough, use a, a small amount of pizza sauce, spread it evenly, and then add our ingredients. I have sliced tomato, fresh mozzarella cheese, and we'll get this right in the oven 
and bake this. We're gonna bake this at a high temperature and we'll see how nice it comes out of, out of the oven. Whether you have a, an impinger oven, whether you have a convection oven or a wood stone oven, the pizza bakes up perfectly every time. So let's get to the oven. So here's our pizza straight out of the oven. We'll add our basil. And we'll cut it up for our customers to enjoy. We have to remember with this pizza crust, the texture is that of real scratch dough without making it from scratch. And I think your guests are gonna love it. So there we have it, an artisan pizza made with our richest, ready to stretch pizza dough. Remember, no proofing, and we get that airy artisan texture with a nice crunchy crust. And I think you're gonna love it. So I invite you to take our new ready to stretch pizza dough, serve it to your customers, and see what great reaction you have. Hey, thanks for joining me in my kitchen today. I hope to see you again real soon. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about a very competitive segment, college and universities. College students are clamoring for plant-based products. And Rich's has a new broccoli and cheese pizza crust and a cauliflower crust. Lots of options you can do with these plant-based crusts. You can, of course, do a pizza, but it makes a great panini, a gluten-free panini. You can also use it as a salad bowl for salads. You can also use it as a gluten-free crust for quiche. You can also do crackers, breadsticks, and gluten-free croutons for salads. The product comes in frozen. It is fully baked. All you need to do is thaw it under refrigeration and see how pliable it is. So you can actually fold it and make paninis out of it. it has a wonderful flavor. In fact, it's college student approved. Here is a dish with spiralized sweet potatoes, clams, and a creamy Asian turmeric sauce. Using a spiralizer, spiralize the sweet potatoes into long, thick noodles. Cook the sweet potatoes in boiling water, stirring gently for about a minute or two. Drain and set aside. Heat the vegetable oil in a wok over medium-low heat. Add the sweet potato noodles. Stir frequently and cook just until tender. Remove from the wok and set aside. In the same wok, add a little oil, add the clams, turn the heat to medium, add the garlic, ginger, and chopped chili pepper. Add coconut milk and no professional liquid concentrate base. Add turmeric and fresh lime juice. Cook until the clams are open, remove, and then set aside. Reduce the broth until it's thick enough to coat a spoon and season to taste. Add the noodles back into the sauce, toss gently, and then add the clams to combine well. Place the noodles and the clams on a plate, sprinkle with furikake, cilantro, and sprouts. Garnish with lime. So here is the finished dish. Enjoy. This is a recipe for beet tartare with a quick cured egg, a modern take on an old classic. Combine the fish sauce, Worcestershire sauce, oyster sauce, honey, hot sauce, garlic cloves, and ground mustard. Gently place the yolks in the marinade. Cover and marinate in the refrigerator for 12 to 24 hours. These beets have been roasted, peeled, and diced. Combine the beets with the mayonnaise, Tabasco sauce, cornichons, capers, and scallions, and toss gently to combine. Season to taste and hold refrigerated. Add a small amount of oil to a cast iron pan. Cut the peeled shallots in half and sear flat side down until they begin to caramelize. Set aside. To plate, use a round cutter to form the beet tartare. 
Place an egg yolk in the middle. Garnish with brulee shallots, radishes, asparagus spears, dill tops, and microgreens. Finish with dots of Hellman's Real Mayonnaise. Here's our beet tartare with quick cured egg. Enjoy. This is a great dish of pressure caramelized carrots with za'atar mayo, candied sunflower seeds, and roasted parsley and carrot top gremoulade. Combine the peeled trimmed carrots with the butter, the baking soda, and a little bit of salt in a pressure cooker. Set the pressure cooker on high pressure for 15 minutes. In the meantime, prepare the gremoulade. Fry the carrot top and parsley leaves in canola oil until translucent and crisp about 15 seconds. Drain on paper towel and sprinkle with salt. Gently toss the fried leaves with lemon zest and set aside. To prepare the za'atar mayo, combine the mayonnaise with za'atar and freshly squeezed lemon juice. Place in a squeeze bottle and refrigerate until ready to use. To prepare the candied sunflower seeds, heat the seeds in a small nonstick pan for about three minutes. Stir in the brown sugar, stirring constantly over medium heat until seeds are coated and the brown sugar has melted. Place on wax paper, sprinkle with salt, and let cool. To serve, place the warm carrots on a plate, drizzle with a za'atar mayo, top with candied seeds and gremolata. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy. This is a light, refreshing dish featuring sustainable seafood. Alaskan black cod with a grapefruit relish and an avocado cream. In a bowl, whisk together the grapefruit juice, soy sauce, mirin, miso paste, and black pepper. Marinate the cod fillets for up to 30 minutes. For the relish, char the jalapeno over an open flame. Once cooled, seed and mince. Combine with the diced grapefruit segments, scallions, sugar, red wine vinegar, and olive oil. Season to taste and refrigerate until ready to use. To make the avocado cream, combine the avocado, garlic, yogurt, Hellman's light mayonnaise, chili, and lime juice in a blender. Blend until smooth. Heat oil in a nonstick saute pan over medium heat. Pan sear the cod until opaque and beginning to caramelize. To serve, place the avocado cream on the bottom of the plate. Top with the fish and the grapefruit relish. Garnish with microgreens. Here's our finished dish. I hope you enjoy. This dish is a fun take on a classic gratiné, hollandaise crusted cauliflower, seasoned with cheese and mustard. Cut the cauliflower into florets, then toss the florets in a mixing bowl with oil, hot sauce, thyme, garlic, salt, and pepper. Place on a sheet pan, lined with parchment paper, and roast at a 425 degree oven until the florets begin to turn golden brown. About 15 to 20 minutes. Remove and set aside. Meanwhile, combine the panko, parsley, lemon zest, and cheeses, then season with the salt and pepper. Combine the Nor liquid hollandaise sauce with the grainy and Dijon mustards. Place the roasted cauliflower in a preheated cast iron pan, top with the hollandaise sauce, and sprinkle with the breadcrumb mixture. Roast for another 10 minutes or until the breadcrumbs are golden brown. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy!